Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Getting Your House in Order. Um, it's pretty funny. I'm sitting here with Carrie Sigler. She originally did this presentation in 2010 and then again in 2013. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years since the last time we've done it. And we've learned a lot in the last 10 years, especially from our clients. Um, I'm thrilled that Carrie agreed to update um, this workshop and present it again. And uh, many clients that come in to this office to this very day credit Carrie's original presentation with their organizational success. And uh, I will also add that in the 37 years of being a financial advisor, I found that organized clients really have a few advantages, that they are more often in a position to take advantage of opportunities, that they rarely get taken advantage of. They know what bills they've paid. They don't get duplicated. Um, they have uh, an easier time preparing their taxes, filling out star applications, loans, mortgages, and most forms. But the biggest thing that they have is greater peace of mind about not only their finances, but their household affairs. Uh, and when it comes to medical records, um, being organized can even help save your life. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to Carrie Sigler. Thanks, Carrie. Get your mic adjusted there. Hello, everyone. Mike, is my level good? Fantastic. All right, here. It's a pleasure to present an updated version of Getting Your House in Order to you all this evening. For those of you who um, saw the Getting Your House in Order presentation years ago, I'd strongly encourage you to please stay tuned in. I believe you'll still find this time to be very worthwhile. This evening, I plan to begin by explaining why getting yourself organized is so important. I'll also be walking everyone through how to set up a filing system that can be the key to getting your life in order. I'll be sure to cover the various sections and documents that the system should contain. After that, I have a number of additional steps that our group feels can help you and your household become even more organized. All right, so here is our disclaimer that we always have to have before a presentation. So, why is this so important for you to get your affairs in order? Well, as you can see here, there are benefits for yourselves and those who may have to step in to handle your affairs while you are both alive and someday after you've passed. So for yourself, we've seen time and time again where taking the time to get your affairs in order will actually help you find important documents much more easily. And it frees your mind knowing everything is in good order for your spouse, family, and friends that may need to step in should something happen where you can no longer handle your own affairs. You no longer have to be thinking or worrying about this possible situation as much, and you can focus on the more enjoyable things in life. Getting things organized also gives peace of mind to spouses. In most cases, we come across couples where there is one spouse who handles the financial affairs for the household, and the other has little knowledge of or interest in the finances. Having things organized for them to be able to take over at any given moment can serve to give them peace of mind and less worry. At the time of an emergency or death of their spouse, they are much less stressed with their financial affairs and can focus on navigating themselves and their families through the grieving process. Lastly, we've seen more and more children having to step in. And keeping things organized for them is becoming more and more important as well. Not only does it help while they still have a living parent that may need more assistance, but it also makes the transfer of assets at the point of death much easier and less stressful. In all the situations that we've come across where a family member is aware of what they must deal with upon their parent's passing, the situations go much more smoothly and they're able to take the time to grieve before being thrown into the depths of their parents' finances. So my hope is that you can already start to see the importance of getting your house in order. But now the question is, how hard is it? I can honestly say it's not that hard and can be done in a simple little box. How many of you know who this is? And 
Yes, I may be younger than a lot of you, but even I know. This is Luther from the TV sitcom Coach. A client recently came into the office and was so excited to let us know that they had everything organized into what Luther called his death box. This was a box he created with everything he wanted someone to know about him upon his death. Well, I'd like to take Luther's idea and put a more cheerful, positive spin on it and refer to it as someone's life box. After all, it's something that won't only be used at someone's passing, but can also be a very useful organization tool while you are very much alive and breathing as well. My hope after tonight is that all our clients might someday have a life box of their own. All right, let's get right into putting together a life box. It's honestly rather easy and inexpensive to obtain. You can order a fire and waterproof safe, like the one pictured here, from walmart.com and have it delivered right to your front doorstep. You can even purchase the hanging files from there as well. You'll need to create your labels, which I'll go over on the next slide, and then collect your documents. The difficulty of this last step will largely depend on how organized or unorganized you are in the first place. No matter how much work you may have ahead of you, I can't stress enough how important it is that you take the time now to do this. Believe me when I say the clients who've put this together in the past and the families who've had to use it are thrilled they went through the exercise. So, you can actually get pretty creative with the information you want to put in your life box and how you'd want to categorize everything. But I'm going to go, be going to proceed forward with Horizon Financial's suggestion and the way I actually organize my information in my own life box. I suggest you create labels for health, banking and investments, legal, insurance, and important documents. You'll see in the following slides that some areas will contain more information than others, but I think these categories cover just about everything. Let's start with health. This is everything related to your health and can easily um, be important if a medical emergency were to arise. Suggestions of items to file in these hanging files would be up-to-date list of all the medical professionals you are currently seeing and may have seen over the last several years. An up-to-date list of prescriptions. Your health care proxy. This is the document that you've signed um, naming the individual who will make medical decisions for you if you're unable. As a side note, it's important that this individual is aware of the role you'd like them to play and they're aware of where this document is. We have suggested in the past that you keep a copy of this in your car's glove compartment in case there's an emergency somewhere and there's not enough time to get home to get the document. Your living will. This is the document that lays out your medical wishes to the person named as your health care proxy. Medical insurance. Keeping a copy of medical insurance cards, dental insurance cards, or having a statement showing coverage information should, could be important especially for a person who's not aware of what your coverage is. If you have the information about what Medicare coverage plans you're on, those should be filed away also. Lastly, emergency contacts. These are people that you want notified if there was a serious medical emergency. This next section, banking and investments, would really involve anything having to do with money. Suggestions for this section would include a list of your financial professionals. This is where you'd include Horizon Financial and any other advisor you may have accounts with. Keeping a statement showing the details of your savings and checking accounts, such as bank name, account number, and routing number, is important. Keeping extra checks or making a note of where they could be found would also be a good idea. If there are beneficiaries listed on these accounts, having either a copy of the original beneficiary paperwork, a statement showing beneficiaries listed, or a note indicating the beneficiaries would be helpful too. As far as investments, keep a statement in this file since it should have all the pertinent information someone may need. Again, having beneficiary information is a good idea also. 
I'd also suggest you file away your most recent Horizon Financial Review packets in these files. I'll actually be touching more on the importance of this packet later in the presentation. Having a note indicating where the safe deposit box is kept and details of payment information is useful too. I have mortgage, loans, and lien releases indicated here. Personally, I'd keep the original loan paperwork in the folder, but if that isn't possible, I'd include a statement that shows the details of the loans, such as the interest rate, terms, current balances, and payment details. If you have loans paid off that you've received lien releases for, keeping the lien release in the life box would be a good idea also. It would also be good to keep a list of credit cards that are open in your name in the file. This includes ones that may not even have balances currently. Lastly, a detailed list of automatic payments indicating the account the payment is debited from, the date, the frequency, the amount, and any other important details could be filed. This would be very helpful for a spouse that's taking over the finances for the very first time. Moving on to your legal documents. Like the other sections, the contact information for your attorney and accountants should go in here. A very important document to file away is your will. Please let your executor or executrix know where the will is. Also, many of you may have had your will written by an attorney that doesn't serve as your attorney on recent affairs. Be sure to include their contact information in the contact information or attach their business card to your will. If you have any trusts established, the originals and any updates should be filed away in this section also. Your power of attorney documents should be saved in here. And again, letting your power of attorney know um, that they're in your life box would be helpful. As far as your tax returns, it could be argued that they be filed here or under finances. Regardless, though, of what you decide, you should keep up to seven years of returns. In order not to take up too much space, you might want to keep your most recent in your life box with a note indicating where the other six are. If you're acting in a legal capacity for someone, like as their power of attorney, I'd probably file those documents in this section, too but keep them separate in order not to confuse anyone else. Moving on to insurance. Again, make sure all contact information for your insurance agents is kept in these files. Be sure to file away the following. Life insurance policies. Keep the policy in the file as well as the most recent bill indicating it's been paid or a receipt if it's possible. I can't stress enough the importance of making sure these policies are paid up. Recently, within one week, we learned of two situations where policies were found to have been lapsed as the covered individual was given a short amount longer to live. Please set reminders to make sure the payments are made and the policies don't lapse. Don't necessarily rely on the mail either. These are important enough to put additional safeguards in place. Also, make sure someone is aware these policies exist. It's shocking how many people are surprised to stumble across a life insurance policy they never knew about. Lastly, remove any and all policies that have purposely lapsed and are no longer valid. A copy of your most recent homeowner's policy should be saved, again, with the payment information. The same goes for the automobile insurance and umbrella policies. For these, make sure you're getting rid of the old policies and replacing them with the new. Don't clutter the system with old, irrelevant information. It may only lend to confusion for someone working through all the information at a later point. Long-term care insurance policies should be saved as well, with premium details and last payment details. I'd encourage anyone who doesn't have a copy of their policy to call your long-term care carrier and order a new copy. Also, if this is a New York State partnership policy, having a document or even a note indicating its partnership plan would be helpful to family, as this may be something they want to let an elder care attorney know of if they ever get to that point. So I'll wrap up the life box filing system with important documents, but there's much more to share after that, so bear with me for a little bit longer. Important documents are pretty much for anything that didn't fall under the previous four categories. As you can see from this list, 
Several of these documents are documents you may need to get your hands on yourself someday. So keeping them all together in one rather safe location could be very helpful to you. Most of these documents listed here are self-explanatory, but I want to draw your attention to your passports. If you don't travel often, you may easily lose track of its expiration. Please don't be like my neighbor who realized the night before a trip to St. Lucia that his passport expired, had to send his family off without him, drove to Buffalo to get an expedited passport renewal, and joined them four days later. It's important to go through this filing system and check on these kinds of things at least once a year to make sure everything is staying up to date. Again, it's a life box. It shouldn't be something that's left to go stagnant and must be maintained and kept up to date as much as possible. Oh, and quickly, one more thing, death certificates. If you have death certificates for a loved one who's passed, please don't get rid of them. You never know when you're going to need um, to, have to, to have proof um, of something someday. So simply file them away and save yourself the headache of tracking down a copy. Some other important documents would include funeral home and burial plot information. Several clients have made these arrangements prepaid and preplanned, and it's important that families know about this. If there are particular wishes that aren't documented with a funeral home, this would be the place to keep those. I know I've shared this a couple of times with clients, but um, on a personal example, my grandmother um, passed away a few years ago, and my mom was putting together her memorial service, and um, she showed me the songs that she was planning um, to have played, and Amazing Grace was on the list, and I told my mom, I stopped her and said, you know, as a little girl, I used to play Amazing Grace on Grandma's organ for her, and Grandma, you know, would compliment me on my efforts, but would, for whatever reason, um, told me that that was a song that she never wanted played at her funeral or memorial service. So um, I saved the day on that one for knowing that information, but um, it just goes to show, you know, these are important details that need to be shared with family members, and this life box would be a great place to keep them. Some people have even chosen to write their own obituaries, and this would be a good spot to keep that. Um, a list of individuals to contact upon your passing would be important as well. Taking the time to make this list will make things so much easier on family and loved ones. Your spouse may not remember that you were staying in contact with an old college roommate or even a past colleague. Children may not remember you had Cousin Nellie in Idaho. I'd suggest you put Horizon Financial on this list um, as a call to make first as well. We're able to provide a lot of guidance to loved ones in these situations. Keeping either a list or recent bills showing service providers, such as cable, internet, and cell phones, um, along with their account information, would be helpful. If there are additional contracts in place, such as snow removal or landscaping, those details should be filed away too. You may have a timeshare or winter rental uh, lined up. These details need to be saved. There may be HOA rules and policies, and those should be saved. Another thing that falls somewhat under these lines would be prepaid items, such as um, trips and vacation. Those details should be kept. And some of you have prepaid memberships or are ticket holders for something like the RPO or Jiva Theater. This is a great place to keep that. Lastly, pet information, especially if you're single, should be kept in case someone needs to assume responsibility for caring for your pet. Okay, so that's the life box. You can customize it to your liking and add fewer or more documents than I've suggested here. But I hope you like the idea of putting a life box together. If you do it, once it's finished, please let someone know you created this life box and let them know where it's located along with the key as well as an explanation of everything in it. Whoever needs to step in to settle your affairs will be extremely grateful for your efforts. I can almost guarantee it. All right, we are not anywhere near done yet, but uh, Mike, if you want to put the on us. We're not anywhere near done yet, but I just wanted to say, Carrie, that was a great uh, uh, part of the, uh, the life box there. That was, that was awesome. Um, I've got a few things to add as I was listening to you. I was making a few notes. 
and I know our clients. So for all of you out there that are pack rats, I just can't stress enough the importance of not junking this up with things that are old, okay? If you have life insurance policies that have been transferred over and are useless, they should be shredded. You can bring those here. If, if you have accounts, uh, IRA accounts that no longer exist, um, please don't put those in there. Those should be shredded. Um, the, really, it's only for things that are active, even those prepaid memberships. Weed this box out once a year so that only the prepaid memberships are there and the prepaid trips. Again, weeding this box is as important as setting it up so that people aren't confused should they have to take it over. Two other points I'd like to make. Um, Carrie, your thought about the health tab, the red health tab, is so, so important. I can't stress it enough. Yesterday, in the middle of my uh, five appointments, I was actually at an assisted living facility and a nursing home trying to advocate for a client. I did not have all of her medical situation. I'm the only living person this person knows, and I am trying to, you know, really, really help out in this situation. And as many of you know, if you don't have an advocate, you can be in trouble. But advocates can't advocate effectively if they don't have information. And really, that health section is so important. And I'm going to tell you from firsthand experience, you cannot count on my chart or whatever the um, digital records are from Strong or RGH. Believe me, you've got to have your own records. And especially, it can mean life and death if a child is coming in out of the clear blue to help you in a hospital situation. Um, the other thing I want to just touch on is POA. I know you, you touched on that, having that in that file. A power of attorney is a very important document to have. And what I will tell you is that uh, it needs to be properly executed and somewhat recently dated. Up until a little while ago, many companies would just refuse them out of hand. Uh, because they didn't want the liability for them, or if they thought there was any reason to reject it, they would. And we actually had lost some clients over that in the years with Fidelity and some other places that just out of hand summarily dismissed a power of attorney, and I'd argue with them. One of the things that you should know is that in, uh, on June 13th of 2021, New York State passed a law uh, with a presumption of validity of POAs. And... Uh, they cannot refuse um, uh, a power of attorney now without reasonable cause. And being long dated is not one of them. But what I would say to you is this, you know, why take that chance? If you have to review these documents and you uh, update them, make sure you just get those updated as well. So, uh, but Carrie, thanks. That was a, that was a wonderful, wonderful um, overview. And I'm going to turn it back over to you again here. All right, so now before you run out or open another browsing window to log into Walmart to order everything that you need for your life box, I want to go over additional ideas you can implement in order to get your house in order. As you can see from this list, the life box is only the first step, and there's much more that can be done. I'll spend some time going through each of these additional steps during the, our remaining time together. So once you've found all the documents you need for the life box, you're probably going to be wondering what to do with the mounds of paperwork you still have sitting in front of you. I'd love to be able to say, throw it away. But that's not always going to be the case. Some may be important enough to keep them in a filing cabinet or a plastic tote. Here's some general guidelines to consider while taking this next step. Keep a year's worth of checking and savings account statements. This will help you and loved ones see what's going in and out of the accounts. Your end statements. If you don't keep these in your life box, at least keep them somewhere else that's clearly marked like a filing cabinet. For individual or joint brokerage accounts, you should keep year end statements for much longer in case cost basis needs to be built. Like I said earlier, you should keep seven years of tax returns along with backup material. I personally have seven small totes that I keep my tax returns and the supporting documents and anything important from that year in. 
I also keep one for the current year where I store anything I'll need to remember for my upcoming tax return, like donation receipts, and in some cases, reminder notes to address um, when I do my taxes. I also keep medical expense receipts in the current year's filing box. Having a file somewhere to keep receipts of major purchases, especially appliances and electronics, is important too. I personally have a file in my filing cabinet where I keep these receipts and all the user manuals. Keeping your receipts for home improvements may also be important someday if you sell a house and need to build cost basis. Lastly, keep warranty information. You often pay for these warranties, and if not filed away, they could easily be forgotten about, which is a potential headache to you and money wasted. Again, as I said earlier, death certificates, marriage certificates, and birth certificates should not be destroyed and ideally kept safe in your life box. Having to obtain these documents at another time can take time and even cost money. Now, here's the fun part, getting rid of the rest of that pile. There's no need to keep statements older than a year. Don't keep receipts for items you no longer have never plan to return, or are for day-to-day -day expenses. We all know if you're signed up to receive paper documents through TD Ameritrade, they send a lot of papers, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it. There's no need to keep proxy notices, the prospectuses, and even trade confirmations. If a trade confirmation is ever needed, we have access to print those out. One other tip. Try keeping up with the piles as they come in, and don't let it stack up. Purging daily or even weekly will make this task much less daunting than if you were to do it only once a year. As far as shredding versus simply throwing it in the garbage, anything that has personal information on it should be shredded. So credit card offers or life insurance offers should, without a doubt, be shredded. When in doubt, though, just shred it. Some of you have previously inquired, but this year, we will unfortunately not be hosting a spring shredding event. We had a very small amount of shredding turned in during our event last May, which leads us to believe everyone has cleaned out over the last couple of years. However, we'll be hosting once again in the fall of 2024. In the meantime, if you have a small amount that you'd like to bring in, put in our shredding bins, bring it into your reviews. Please feel free to bring it. Also, watch for notices from community centers, town halls, and local churches. Many of them host shredding events throughout the year as well. If none of these are options, please don't drive yourself crazy and go out and get an expensive shredder. Keep it simple. Just tear your documents into several pieces. Chances are very rare that anyone is going to get into your garbage and spend the time putting everything back together. If you don't want to have folders for everything, you could take another approach and create a notebook or binder that works in conjunction with your life box. We have a client who has a binder that includes 26 tab dividers. He's actually broken it down into all the information he fe feels his daughter will need to know should she have to step in to help he and his wife. He's included details on things such as the garage door and code information, who he's given keys out to, the maintenance details of his golf cart, and his homeowner association details, including fees and dues. This form of organizing data will need to be maintained as things change, but creating a master copy that family members are aware of could be extremely helpful. A copy could even be given to family members, especially if they may not live nearby and may have to deal with some of this um, in the future from a distance. So looking at whether you need to update or add beneficiaries is another important step. All of your bank accounts, life insurance policies, investment accounts, IRAs and individual, and even on your employer plans like 401ks and 403bs should be reviewed. We've seen clients with 401ks that they opened when they were in their 20s still have their parents listed, even though they've been married for several years. There have been instances when a child was missing because the beneficiaries didn't get updated after their birth. 
Life events may have changed information or even the people you once had listed. So it's important to review this information from time to time. Every time this is updated, keep a copy of the paperwork in your life box. A lot of clients come into the office unaware that they, add, um, that they can add beneficiaries to bank accounts. This information is often known as transfer on death, payable on death, or in trust for. Just talk to a customer service rep the next time you're in your local branch. I also want to make sure clients know the difference between primary beneficiaries and contingent beneficiaries. A primary beneficiary is the person or people who will receive the assets or money when the account owner dies. There can be more than one, and their shares can be divided however the owner uh, wants. However, they need to equal 100%. A contingent beneficiary is a person or people who will receive the assets or money only if all primary beneficiaries are deceased. In most cases, these beneficiaries can have the designation of per capita or per stirpes added to them as well. Per capita simply means that if there are more than one primary beneficiaries and one is deceased, the person's shares will be divided equally to the remaining beneficiaries. Per stirpes means that the deceased person's shares will be divided equally among their children as opposed to the other primary beneficiaries. Their children include blood and adopted children, but not stepchildren. So why is having beneficiaries so important? Well, these instructions supersede a will, and these accounts will not be subjected to probate. For anyone who's handled an estate that's had to go through probate, it can be a rather lengthy process, one that differs state by state, and one that can be avoided with this simple designation. For those of you unfamiliar with the probate process, basically, it is a legal procedure that wraps up the estate of someone who dies, ultimately transferring the net assets of the entitled beneficiaries, or the net assets to the entitled beneficiaries or heirs. When a deceased individual leaves a will, someone must file the will with the probate court to open probate. If the court determines that the will is valid and properly executed, it appoints a personal representative to administer the estate. If no valid will exists, the deceased is deemed to have died intestate. The court supervises probate. However, the day-to-day -day administration is handled by either the executor or executrix, if the person had a will, or an administrator if no will existed. Letters of testamentary are issued, giving these individuals the legal right to handle the estate matters, and they become in charge of collecting the deceased assets, including endorsing and depositing checks, as well as paying their bills. Like I said, it's rather time-consuming and much more complex than having beneficiaries. Another reason people may want to avoid probate is that the estate's assets are publicly aired in the process, leaving the doors open for creditors to come collecting on the debt the deceased individuals may have had. So I know this is a lot of information on beneficiaries, but it just goes to show that beneficiaries are important to review and in some cases add to accounts that don't already have them. Here's another thing I'd like to throw out um, there for you to consider. When a person passes away, there are often expenses that come up that family members may not be able to easily handle out of their own cash flow. And the deceased funds are often frozen and not immediately available either. One way to avoid this would be to set up a checking or savings account that is joint with someone else. Maybe it's the person you've named as executor or another family member. If an account is joint, the person has immediate access to these funds. The only downfall is that these funds are technically the joint individuals to use whenever. And if you intend to have them disperse these funds to others after your death, there's no binding obligation for them to do so. So you'd want to make sure it's a trusted individual. For these reasons, I suggest this account not be your entire checking or savings account balance. Just something to help the person sell settling your affairs get by until the letters of testamentary are issued and someone has access to the funds. Another reason to be a bit cautious is that since these funds are considered the joint owners as well, the funds are subjected to lawsuits and could be distributed in a divorce settlement. 
Also worth pointing out, check writing privileges cease at death. So be careful if you're thinking check writing privileges serve the same purpose as joint owner. Along those lines are credit card authorized users versus joint holder. An authorized user does not have the credit tied to their name and has no legal responsibility for making the payment. They can only use the card for making purchases. A joint owner shares the credit and the responsibility. This is important because people often don't know the difference and many spouses have an authorized user arrangement. At the death of the account holder, the account will need to be closed, leaving that line of credit unavailable to the living spouse. In some cases, it may become difficult or impossible for the living spouse to obtain any credit in their name, especially if they don't have a credit history. In order to protect against this scenario, making sure both spouses have a credit card in each of their names individually, or one that's joint, is something highly worth considering. For anyone that's recently had a review at Horizon, you know that we often ask whether your wills, POAs, healthcare proxies, and living wills are in good order, and we track it. The reason we do this is they're extremely important documents. I know I touched on this earlier while talking about the legal section within your life box, but here I've stated what each of these documents is for your reference. For those of you with children, in addition to know to what I've noted here, your will could be used to determine who will care for your kids should you pass away. If a will has been drawn up, the state will, if a will hasn't, I should say, been drawn up, the state will be making that determination on your behalf. Again, I can't stress the importance of these documents enough. It's something so many of us don't want to think about. But let me tell you, from our experience with hundreds of families, having to get these documents drawn up, such as a POA, while a family member is incapacitated, is much more difficult than the process that comes along with putting a POA in force um, that's been previously drawn up. To make this even easier, most legal firms offer these documents as a package. And in the scope of things, it isn't all that expensive. So talk to your friends and family to see who they've used, and make an appointment soon. The topic of usernames and passwords is something that gets brought up quite a lot. Years ago, I introduced the idea of a spreadsheet and saving the information on a USB stick. However, in all honesty, I don't know if that's the safest place to keep this, especially if there's the risk of this document still being saved somewhere on your computer or having the USB stick getting into the wrong hands. Let's face it. Having a username and password combo could be giving someone the keys to the kingdom. We actually saw um, this this year. Um, somehow hackers gained access to the username and password um, for a client and went online um, and got access to the client's bank account. Um, I should say it's not. it was not an account at Horizon and it was not off of the USB stick that I introduced years ago. Um, but unfortunately, these hackers help themselves to thousands of dollars. So it is a serious thing. I do see value in having this information organized, though, for spouses and loved ones. So I recommend you do what makes you comfortable. But be extremely careful. Research I've read claims online password organization systems are the best way to organize this information. However, there's still risk. So do your due diligence on the options you have available to you and choose these systems carefully. Additionally, when possible, set up two-factor authentication if offered on sites you log into. This is an added layer to the login process and makes it much more difficult for someone to log in using your credentials if you get hacked. So I've mentioned this several times throughout this evening's workshop, but I want to take a moment to pay special attention to it. Please consider sharing your financial situation with someone else. I understand that these are often considered private matters, but think for a second on how difficult it may be for someone to figure it all out if you're no longer able to manage this information or communicate everything you know. Some steps I'd really like you to consider are including your spouse, um, in your financial affairs from this point going forward and get them involved in the decisions you typically make on your own. If you've already done a life box or are 
going to be doing one, don't keep it to yourself, and please let important people in your life know about it. Consider showing someone where all your important things are located, whether it be in an office, under a bed, in a special drawer, or under a rock covering a hole in the backyard. Lastly, informing your POAs, especially if not your spouse, of this information is extremely helpful going and going over your will with executors will be helpful too. If this is something you are having a hard time doing yourself or loved ones want to avoid the conversation, we get it. We see it time and time again, but that's why we're here to help and to encourage these conversations. In fact, over the last two years, we've gotten involved and had several clients bring in their children to introduce them to their financial situation. We really enjoy these meetings because we get to meet the family you also often talk to us about. And it's also relieving to know the family is more aware of the client's situation. And our first point of contact with these family members will not be at the moment a health event has occurred, or even worse, at a client's passing. If this sounds like something you'd like to do, these meetings can be accomplished during a regularly scheduled review or at another time, maybe when a family member is in town. We can also do these meetings via Zoom or on a conference call. We've had clients come into the office and we've all Zoomed with their children located all across the United States. You can also indicate what it is that you'd like us to share and what you might like to keep private for the time being. We will act within the boundaries you set. By now, most of you have been able to see our new review packet, which is much more detailed than we were able to provide in the past. This packet serves multiple purposes, including giving us the information we need in order to give you financial advice. However, in your case, it can be used as yet another tool for organization. As long as you continue to update us on all the information I've listed here, this packet can lead loved ones to have a much better understanding of your financial affairs. Also, if they don't necessarily stumble across this packet, but have us listed as your financial advisor and one of the first people who should be contacted, with the proper documentation, we can offer them a lot of direction through this information you've provided. It's proved to be very, very useful in the past and has been a lifesaver to individuals who've been thrust into the position of executor with little to no knowledge of the person's financial affairs. So we encourage each and every one of you to please continue to come prepared for your reviews with updated information. You never know how helpful it could be to loved ones someday. And with that, I'd like to conclude this evening's presentation on getting your house in order. In speaking on behalf of anyone who's had to step forth and help family members who have not kept their affairs in an organized fashion or shared any of their information, I hope you strongly consider putting some or all of what I presented tonight into action. I do hope that I hear of several life boxes being created, so please let us know if you've gone ahead and completed the exercise. But don't necessarily stop there. There's much more that can be done. I'd also love to hear of more suggestions you might have. The Lifebox filing guidance will soon be available uh, within the blog section of our website, so please refer to that for further assistance. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me by emailing our client services email seen on the screen. Well, thank you, Carrie. I'm going to, let me say this again now that I got the mic in front of me. Thank you, Carrie. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. And I just want to expand upon just a couple last things that you said. Um, your idea about how you use totes for your taxes, I do the exact same thing. Ever since I've gone to that system, it's been fantastic. I keep two totes, one for the current tax year, and sometimes you get things ahead for the next tax year. So I keep two of them. I throw them in the proper boxes, and it makes it so easy at tax time just to sort through everything and make sure I've got all my statements, I've got everything, and everything's pulled together. I do have a big tip, though. You said keep one year's worth of bank statements and that sort of thing, and I totally agree with that. However, a lot of people out there have parents that may qualify for Medicaid. Most of our clients will not because of their resources. But if you know anyone that's going to qualify for Medicaid that's infirmed, 
please get a tote for that. And you're going to want to keep five years worth of bank statements because at the time of application, they are going to make you go and get copies and get five years worth of bank statements and savings account statements. So I just want that little tip for someone, maybe if they're going to get their parents organized or something like that as well. Um, this is very important for yourself, folks, but it is critical for the spouse, the child, the friend that's one hospital stay away from running your life. And it's imperative to have this done. So I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, get to work. But number two, many of you are privacy nuts. As Carrie just said a few slides ago, please, 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 you can do all this work, but if you don't tell anyone, it really is worthless if they have to find it. So please make sure that you do share your situation with someone. And as she says, we're here to facilitate that. I can't thank you enough for tuning in tonight. I can't thank Carrie enough for her wonderful job. And I can't thank you enough for being clients of the Horizon Group. I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Thanks.